Uh, thank you, John. Many of you in the audience think that surgical knowledge is an oxymoron. I'm going to actually try to actually give you some ideas of what we do in the operating room beside playing music and having fun. Um, if we can start the video. So what I'm going to discuss today is basically an ileal pouch, and I particularly talk about three-stage procedures versus two-stage procedures, and what exactly are those. Let's just start that off right off the bat. Um, this is a schematic. If you can just uh, stop the video for a second. On the left-hand side, this is actually the initial phase of a three-stage procedure, where actually you take just the colon out, but you leave the bottommost portion, the rectum, in place. Is this working? No. Um, Pardon me? Oh, the mouse is working. Okay. I don't think it's working. Okay. Uh, that's the initial stage, and then after, that's the, that's the first of three stages. The second of the three stages is actually when you take the rectum out and make an ileal J pouch showed on the right, and then the third is actually when there's an, there's an ileostomy still created, and that ileostomy itself is reversed. We call that a three-stage procedure in our field. On the right-hand side is where the initial two phases are put together. The total abdominal colectomy and the ileal pouch is connected, the main difference being that the rectum is removed and the pouch is created. Uh, and in the final phase of that two-stage procedure, uh, the ileostomy is reversed. If we can start the video back up, please. There's many different reasons why surgeons pick two stages and three stages. Many, most of them are related to sickness of the patient or the inability of the J pouch to stretch. So this is just a video. Basically, imagine you're sitting on the left-hand side of the patient. There's a blue dot at the upper right. Uh, you can see that's the proposed ileostomy site. What we're marking off now is a right angle uh, triangle to make a fan and steel incision. Most of us actually now do these in fan and steel incisions, although there's a big controversy over that. Uh, the advantage of this particular incision is it's actually below the hairline or below the bikini line, which is an advantage, obviously, particularly for young patients. Now, you're in a different uh, spot. You're probably where you were as a medical student in between the legs holding retractors. So imagine you're looking up now. This is basically the incision going through the various layers. That's scarpus fascia, if you remember from your anatomy. This is the anterior sheath of the uh, rectus being pulled off. And then we have the muscle underneath, and we usually measure out about an eight centimeter incision or so underneath. We open up that to gain access into the abdominal cavity. Obviously, there's no laparoscopy done yet, but you'll see where that comes in. This is the hand assist uh, ileal pouch anastomosis. There have been studies that they're showing that you get the same advantage over hand assist as you, as you do over uh, total laparoscopic uh, surgery. So this is basically the way we do it. The other advantage of putting this gel, this, this particular instrument, is it actually reduces uh, wound infection rates. A trocar now is being placed in the umbilicus. You can see, and now this is the, another trocar being placed in the right lower quadrant. That becomes a, the future ileostomy site. We take advantage of the fact that we have to make a hole for the ileostomy and therefore use a trocar through it. This is a, something, it's an instrument called a gel port where we actually insufflate through that and then we gain access into the abdominal cavity by injecting air. So what we do is we actually start, this is the right colon. The instrument you see coming into your view is, a, is just a way to actually we confuse tissue. This is actually, this particular one is called a ligature. Uh, in our institution, we call this the MGI, man's greatest instrument. This basically fuses everything you can, gets excellent hemostasis, and is useful for uh, dissection. So what we're doing is we're taking the colon now. We're taking, uh, on the right-hand side, we're, you can see the gallbladder in the distance, the liver in the distance as well. This is the hepatic flexure. If we're coming around here, we have to be very careful to avoid not only the kidney and the ureter, but also the duodenum, which we'll show you in a minute. Duodenum is in the distance right underneath there, shown very nicely by the duodenal letters. It's usually not like that in the OR. Uh, basically now, and then after we basically mobilize the colon to the mid-transverse colon, we actually then pay attention to the vessels. And this is a very important part of the procedure that we do. We try to preserve the ilocolic artery. The ilocolic artery is a vital procedure, a vital a vessel to keep, and I'll show you why later on that is for, uh, for pouch length. Sometimes that vessel is very thick, either because of the disease itself or because of, mes of um, mesenteric thickening induced by steroids, which actually makes our job a little more difficult, and obviously the inability to do the J-pouch at that point, which uh, uh, necessitates a three-stage procedure. After we identify the ilocolic artery, we identify the mesentery of the colon just distal to that, and we incise that. So we gain access into the mesentery, and now we start mobilizing the colon. We have not mobilized any of the colon or divided any of the colon. We can actually leave the surgery if we wanted to at this point. Uh, leave the patient, obviously we don't do that. Um, we can continue the video. For some reason it stopped. So let's see, where are we? So we've now dissected the mesentery. We're now taking the mesentery of the colon now. So this now is actually beyond the point of no return. 
And we start taking the mesentery of the, uh, this is the hepatic flexure, come across, again, watching the duodenum as we come across. And as we're doing this, we're obviously making sure that the small bowel is not injured. One of the ways that we, oh, actually the, the video went very far ahead, I apologize, but basically the colon's been mobilized and now we take this off. And this now is the fun part, we usually have the medical student do this, where we actually extract the colon. We lost about four minutes of video here, but. One, one second. Yeah, uh, David, this is such an important microphone, please. Uh, I'm sorry, can we stop the video temporarily, please? This is a very important part for us, so let's go back one second. Uh, microphone, please. Can you get the microphone, please? Uh, Lesher, I would like to go back, please. This is really important for us to bond as surgeons and uh, gastroenterologists. Please, take your time. It's the way we can go back to maybe the um, four-minute moment or so, if possible, just as a guesstimate. Okay, that I guess will work for now. Thank you. Yeah. So just going back again. So we now have taken the mesentery of the right colon. You can see as we take the mesentery of the right colon, we identify the small bowel below us. That's, in fact, how we know we're going full thickness through the mesentery. We're now coming across the midline. That structure that you see running across the middle at the top, that's the falciform ligament in the anatomic midline of the abdomen. We're continuing the dissection of the transverse colon mesentery. The small bowel is below you, uh, below us, right there. We can obviously stay away from the small bowel uh, while we're doing this. And we can continue the section up to the splenic flexure. Very important, obviously, to stay as close. This is not cancer. Cancer, you have to stay relatively far away from the colon. When you're doing IBD in general, you don't have to stay very uh, you know, far away from the colon. You should stay close to the colon as you can. Point being is you try to stay away from the splenic bed and obviously minimize the incidence of injuries. As you're doing this, you can see the structure on the left. That's the, the stomach. We're staying away from that as well. We've actually had one patient where the stomach was inadvertently injured, so we're very, very careful about that now. And we come around the hepatic, I'm sorry, the splenic flexure, continuing our dissection down towards the left-hand side of the abdomen. This is all being done with the assistance of a hand. Again, it can be done in addition total laparoscopic. It certainly does take longer total laparoscopic, uh, but we can talk about that some other time. Once that gets done all the way down to the left colon, we take some more of the attachments of the terminal ileal mesentery here. You can see again, we're now on back on the right side because you can see the gallbladder in the distance. And this is actually where we actually get mobility of that end. So this is where we were before. This gel port is removed, and now the colon itself is mobilized up and out. Again, the medical student usually likes to do this because it's a cool part of the procedure. Looks gross to most people. And then what we do is we identify the terminal ileum. The only place on the, on, the term, on the small bowel where there's anti-mesenteric fat is right at the terminal ileum. So the first thing we do is we take that f a wad of fat off that you're seeing right there. And then what we do is we transect the ileum flush with the ileocecal valve. Uh, and uh, that, that actually staple line will become eventually the, the efferent limb of the J-pouch. We now take some of the vessels and actually now the colon has been essentially removed. Now can I just stop the video for a second, if possible? This is a patient we did on Saturday. This is what the way the subtotal colectomy, the first of a three-stage procedure looks. This is immediately after surgery. You can see the fan and seal incision. That little black mark that you see off the ileostomy is, a, is actually a tattoo that the patient had that wanted us to, wanted us to preserve. Ileostomy in the right lower quadrant, the little cross that you see on the other side is, is a marking for another stoma which was not used. So you can see potentially when the patient actually heals from this and they actually put on a pair of shorts, the only thing that shows is the ileostomy. Okay, can we continue with the video, please? Now, this now is, let's presume we've actually done that procedure, the patient now has recovered, and now we're doing the second of the three-stage procedures. So the patient has an ileostomy. So what we're doing now is we're taking the ileostomy down, and we're gonna take out the rectum and now make the ileal J pouch. So this is the mobilization of the, of the um, uh, ileostomy off the anterior abdominal wall. A lot of times these are actually tedious, Thankfully, sometimes they're, they're easy. There are some things that we do at the initial surgery to try to minimize adhesions around here. There's actually something called, uh, it's a, 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 a basically a mesh that we, not a mesh, a, a biofilm that we actually put in to actually reduce scar tissue, form, scar tissue formation. Once we get the ileostomy mobilized, as you can see here, we take particular care to preserve those blood vessels. I think you see a little bit bleeding there, we control that. But most, and additionally, you can see that there's some adhesions in the right uh, lower, I'm sorry, in the right lower edge. Those are being taken down. Those are very important because those actually, those need to be all lysed because those are the things that actually hold the small bowel into a configuration that potentially might not allow that ileal J pouch to reach down in the pelvis. Remember, we're taking the small bowel, which belongs in the abdomen, and bring it all the way down into the pelvis. That sometimes could be a challenge. 
We then close off that end that was the ileostomy with a stapler. That becomes the end of the, of the ilium, or the end of your J-pouch when you actually do it. And we'll show you that in a minute. Then this is the incision again. Imagine you're between the legs again. This is what the incision looks like after it's healed. So we use the same incision that we actually had at the initial uh, uh, phase of the initial surgery. We mark it off very nicely. We're very important to mark off, not only because I live in Los Angeles, because many of these patients are actually young and actually want to have fancy incisions for their bikinis. So we actually take a lot of care to make sure the incisions are straight. And we actually we make sure that we put those little lines on there to ensure that we actually, when we approximate them, that the incisions remain straight. We actually then go into the abdominal wall again, just like we did essentially the first time. This time around, because of scar tissue, the dissection planes are a little more interesting. They can sometimes be fairly bloody, and the tissue planes uh, abnormal. You can see already. We continue this, this dissection down all the way, basically the way we did before, to the fascia and the muscle, as you see here. And eventually we put in, just like we did on the first time, essentially a, 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 a wound protector. Again, the, one of the only things that actually has been shown to consistently reduce wound infections, which is a major problem after colorectal surgery, is the use of a wound protector. So you'll actually see now that once we get in here and we open up to down to the muscle layer in a second, we'll actually then put that plastic uh, sheath in there, which actually protects the skin from bacteria which are actually disseminated uh, through an either open bowel or just even, quite frankly, the time of the surgery. You can see the ileostomy at the top left of the screen. This then gets access again in. You can see that wound protector that's being placed. The addition of the wound protector also allows us to splay open the wound so we can actually see a little bit better. So it actually makes the visualization of the pelvis much, more, much, uh, much better for us. Now the next thing we do is we need to make sure that that ileal J-pouch is going to reach down into the pelvis. Where that instrument, as you can see right there, is pulling the J-pouch that, down. That will actually become the apex of the J-pouch, which will be hooked up to the anus. You can see that there's a loop of intestine, two loops that are folded back on itself. And what we're doing now is we're trying to assess the length to make sure that actually the J-pouch can reach. Once we're sure of that, then we can proceed on to the next phase. If you can put the slide, uh, can we stop the video temporarily, please? So again, if you look on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, the initial surgery has already been, in, uh, been done. The colon's been removed. So now all we're going to end up doing is removing the rectum and then making the ileal J-pouch, as shown on the right, hooking that to the anus, and now giving another ileostomy. Video back on, please. The video on, please. I think it's coming. So now, basically, again, you're between the legs looking down. That's the rectal stump, what it looks like after it's been stapled off of the original surgery. We're making incisions on either side. We're now developing, uh, it's the superhemorrhoidal artery. It's a very important artery for us. Once we get underneath that plane, again, using that, um, that uh, tissue ligator that you see on the right, that will actually control hemostasis, that enters us into a very nice surgical plane, which we call the presacral space, or total mesorectal plane. That's actually not only used for IBD, but it's also critical in the surgical management of uh, rectal cancer. We continue this dissection down, and we actually get, I'll show you the nice uh, plane in a second. They're not always like this, but usually the videos you show your best cases, as you know. But basically, you can see there's a nice plane there, and that's what it looks like. There's a little bit of a fat plane that you can see on the inferior border with a little blood vessel coming across it. That's the mesorectum. And we can dissect in that plane. And if you're actually in the correct plane, there's very little, if any, blood loss. It's essentially a bloodless plane. It's anatomic plane. And all of us as, as colorectal surgeons know very well that plane. Very important to stay in it if you can. Also reduces the incidence of genital urinary dysfunction if you can. We continue the dissection down as low as you can, basically all the way to the pelvis. Additionally, we actually go anteriorly to stay away. Uh, this, I believe, was a, a male. So actually, I don't see the uterus. So actually, we, obviously, we stay away from the... Um, the prostate in this particular situation. And we continue to section all the way around, circumferentially until the rectum is mobilized all the way down to the pelvic floor. And now we're be getting ready to transect the rectum. Again, you're between the legs looking down, holding that metal thing. If you can hold the video for a second, please. On the left is one of the things we do now is mesenteric lengthening. And this is a way to, again, additionally, as I'm trying to emphasize, we try to get our J-pouch down to the pelvis, which sometimes can be a stretch, literally. As you can see on the left, we actually do a number of techniques, including making divisions within the mesentery. But most importantly, you can see that we actually try to preserve that vessel that you see running up the midline, running up the side. That's the ilicolic artery that I showed you before on the initial colectomy. That's why it's very, very important to try to preserve that vessel if we can. 
The J pouch itself is created by the schematic shown on the right. I'll show you what it looks like in vivo. But basically what you're doing is you're folding the J pouch back on itself, just like the, look, it looks like a J. I think everyone would agree with that. You basically put the two ends back together again, and then you can see on the right in the corner, it actually looks almost like a double eye, which is what you see endoscopically when you do pouchoscopy. Video back on, please. When you do pouchoscopy, the so-called owl's eye. That's exactly what it looks like when you do a pouchoscopy. So this is basically the J pouch now. There's some, uh, um, uh, marks that you see in the mesentery right in the middle of the screen, that's what we use to try to get additional length. This is the J pouch now being folded back on itself, being pulled down to ensure that it's actually able to reach down. And then what we do is we put some stitches in the apex of that J pouch, well, it's, which is itself is the way going to become the anastomosis to the anus. This um, is the, the J pouch being oriented, or at least the limbs, the two limbs of that J being oriented, by, uh, just to keep them in place. This, that where I'm pointing right there is the efferent limb. That's important to just because that becomes, there's a stitch there to actually keep that in place so it doesn't twist on itself. The limb that I'm holding up now, that is the afferent limb. That's the limb when you do a pouchoscopy, you actually go up and you actually see potential inflammation consistent with Crohn's disease. This is another view, of this, I apologize for the, um, for the uh, distortion, the focus, but we're now making a small little uh, enterotomy at the base of that J pouch. We actually gain access into it and then we put in a surgical stapler. The stapler invariably is very large in this particular uh, procedure. So what it does is you'll notice it rips a little bit, but nothing uh, dangerous to the J pouch. And that uh, stapler is actually placed on one side of the J pouch and on the other side of the J pouch. If you look at that stapler, it's got two lines and a knife in between and actually literally fires and seals at the same time. So those two limbs are basically fused together like I showed you in the schematic before, showing the J pouch coming up here now. And then you fire it, lays down staples. This is a 100 millimeter stapler. This is an enormous diamond stapler at one time. You can see the staple line uh, right in the middle of that. This is now being reinserted to make the J pouch even longer. Most of these J pouches, when we're done, end up anywhere between 15 to 25 centimeters in length. This is going all the way up, and that's your completed J pouch. It actually has a, a little sponge at the bottom to keep it dry. This is the J pouch basically now being, uh, as it's already been created. Stop the video, please. There are two ways now to actually reconstruct after the J pouch is created. The one on the left is what, mo what most people do in the United States now, is to double staple, where what you do is you tr go down on the rectum as low as you can, you put a stapler across it as shown in, in A and B, and then what you do is you then bring up a stapler you, uh, from the bottom and you hook up everything with some nice fancy surgical staples which we have. The problem with that, if you believe in this particular technique, is you leave some of the rectal lining. That lining can become caphitis which you may have heard about, okay? On the left is actually a hand-sewn ileal pouch anastomosis where the mucosa, the lowermost portion, is actually removed. I want to show you a video of what that looks like. Uh, keep going. Video back on, please. This instrument does, is not from uh, Bohemian times. This is basically something called a Lone Star Retractor. This basically effaces everything. And then this is schematically what we do. We basically just remove the lining. It's essentially a fancy EHR, okay, or EMR. Basically, we're just doing this. So this is what we do. We put that instrument on. I apologize for using a hairy male, but actually it is what it is. And you can basically see we're putting the, that instrument, which again looks like those sharp hooks. They can actually be sometimes very sharp. Do not do this at home, gentlemen, <laughs> okay? Um, and basically what this does is he faces the anus to allow us to actually gain access into the anal canal. This again is with a hand-sewn iliopouch anastomosis. This is not the way a double staple technique is used, is, uh, sorry, is performed. And what we do is we identify the dentate line with, the, with that little uh, bovie over there. We point to it. And then what we do is we, make a, we score it so we know exactly where the dentate line is. Remember, in this particular technique, we're trying to remove all the lining. That's the whole purpose, if you believe in mucosectomies, to actually try to cure the disease, to get rid of all the lining. It's all done circumferentially. And again, just like you do an EMR, you basically infiltrate some saline. Obviously, it's done open, not through a colonoscope. But basically, you infiltrate, you raise the mucosa. The mucosa comes off of the underlying muscle, which is the smooth muscle, also known as the internal sphincter, basically the anal sphincter. Without injuring the sphincter at all, you basically raise that up to try to preserve anal sphincter function, which is critical. This is where everything has been raised up. And now what you do is you start dissecting out the mucosa around this area. Basically what you do is you pull down the mucosa with the forceps and you start taking that off. You want to stay away from some structures that are white 
White is smooth muscle, also known as white meat, just like chicken. And basically, that's basically one, what you want to stay away from. As you dissect in the submucosal plane here, you take the whole mucosa out, and you've basically done a mucosectomy. You can stop the video temporarily, please. This is basically now, so what you're left with is you're left with a cuff of muscle. I'll be a second, Fez. Uh, with a cuff of muscle, you basically now bring the J-pouch through it. That's why this procedure is also called an A-pull-through, where you're pulling through the J-pouch into that remnant of the rectum. Start the video back, please. And what you do, this is the way it looks after. You basically see the cut edge of the mucosa, and you can actually see that the muscle underneath is left in place. The J-pouch now is brought, this is from the top, view from the top, is brought down through, and then we use through that fancy instrument just some stitching to actually put everything back together again. This is the schematic of the way it looks, and in vivo, this is the way it looks. You can see some sutures that have already been placed at the four quadrant uh, areas to allow it to remain in place. And then what we do is we take edges of that, of that pouch and bring it down. Now you can see that even now it looks like it's kind of hard to do, and the reason it's hard to do is that that posterior side of that J pouch is frequently held by mesentery because it's a length issue. That's one of the things that I've been trying to emphasize in this procedure, I'm, I'm sorry, in this talk, is that length is enormously important in this procedure to actually allow it to reach to the anus. And we do everything we possibly can, particularly with a hand-sewn anastomosis, to get this uh, J pouch down as, fa as far as we can. This is the stitch now onto the anal side. It takes a little bit of the, of the muscle and a little bit of the mucosa. This actually was done by my fellow, and actually she missed the mucosa on this particular bite. But basically then you lay it down, and now everything gets sewn in. And the ileal pouch anal anastomosis hand sewn has now been created. In almost all cases now, you actually divert these patients with a diverting loop ileostomy. That's shown here, as the ileostomy itself is being created. And if you can stop the video in one second, and stop, that's the way the incision looks, and if, let it keep going. And this is the way it looks when it's done, there's an ileostomy. Thank you for your time.